Welcome to the County Seat Today, I'm Chad Booth. Before we get started, I would like to ask you a question. How do you like the look of our new program? I would love to hear your thoughts about it. Today, we're going to tell you a magical story from the range. How when it comes to cattle and grazing, more is better. Now, I know that sounds crazy and some of you are coming out of your seats, but sit tight and let's start with the basics. Here's Joe. In December of 2017, the U.S. Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management signed an agreement to allow a group of ranchers in Rich County to consolidate their individual grazing allotments into one large allotment they'll equally share. The net result, they hope, will be to improve the range, wildlife habitat, watershed, and grazing capacity by moving cows and sheep across the land at a faster pace giving the land more time to rest than a typical summer-winter grazing arrangement. It's a management plan that has yielded big results for neighboring cattle giant Deseret Land and Livestock. The combined allotments kind of work like a deeded timeshare resort condominium. Each allotment holder still has their share of ownership, but is also a share of an undivided whole instead of individual leases. The larger aggregate acres will allow grazing for a shorter period of time using smaller percentages of the forage on the ground, leaving more forage intact to regrow. It also has less impact on individual water sources and leaves more food and cover for the wildlife while the cows and sheep are away. Based on Deseret's experience, the ranchers should be able to increase the number of animals on the ground, increasing herd size for the allotment holders while increasing deer and elk populations, sage grouse numbers, and water quality across the board. But with all of that upside, there's a downside too. The cows are gonna have to go back to school, along with the deer, elk, and the ranchers. Well, let me explain. At first, herds of livestock will likely be stressed as they have to move around more and learn new grazing patterns. No doubt the ranchers will have to work harder to keep the herds on the move and wildlife have to learn a different pattern of sharing the resources. It will also require more scientific planning and a much more complicated grazing calendar. The idea of it all is to get cattle and sheep to graze more like nomadic herds of buffalo or antelope. It will take an investment in the land and learning curve for the ranchers, cattle and wildlife to learn how to navigate that new system. But water resource managers, wildlife managers, land and range managers all have faith that it'll work. Chad will be back to discuss how that project came to be and what needs to be done to get it up and running. For the county seat, I'm Joe Davis. This is what adventure looks like. And here's what it sounds like. Southwest Utah's Iron County offers some of the most iconic trails within the state that include 200 miles of new trails to be discovered. Check out ironcounty.net for info and interactive maps for your complete guide to off-roading. Explore countless miles of trails in the heart of Dixie National Forest, the gateway to Utah National Parks, Iron County. In a place that is beyond words, there is nothing to be said, except take your time in Bryce Canyon country. What would you do with an extra day in Utah Valley? Explore the Wasatch Mountains? Snap a family photo at Bridal Veil Falls. Cool off on Utah Lake or the Provo River. No 
matter what you're searching for, you can find it in Utah Valley. Bring everyone together. Welcome back to the county seat. We are talking about timed grazing today and the impact it's making and hopefully will make on ranching across Utah and the West. Joining us for conversation are people who are very experienced at this particular topic. One of the permittees of the Three Creek uh, grazing area, Dale Lamborn, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. And uh, we also have Troy Forrest, who is the GIP manager. I think that stands for Grazing Improvement Program for the Utah Department of Agriculture and Food. Thanks for joining us today. You bet, thank you. When the, w this concept was first discussed with you, Dale, as a permittee, did you just go, whoa, wait a minute, or what was your response to it? Well, I think there were, there were some critical concerns I had going in. Uh, first of all, you've got to get 36 permittees to ag agree and jump on board of the plan. Uh, you got to get BLM and Forest Service to work together, which is not always easy to do. And you've got to have a plan that makes sense uh, both for the resource, for the permittees, for the agencies. And so, yeah, it was a, a big challenge going into it. But the amazing thing is, as we've got everybody on board and, and we're there. Who came up with the idea originally to say, let's do, let's repeat desert land and livestock and let's put it out there with some smaller allotments? Well, it was Alvin Shaw that came to Bill Hopkin and I. Alvin's a permittee on the allotments. Uh, he, 40 years ago, worked at Deseret as a cowboy and had rolled that range and saw the condition he was in and then he had moved to Wyoming and run a family ranch for about 25 years. Came back to Rich County and in about 2010, went on a tour on Deseret and saw the marked change in the results, in the ground cover, in the wildlife that were there, in everything about Deseret. And so he came to us and he says, uh, you know, they did that there, why can't we do it on public lands? And so with Alvin's help, we got together with BLM and Forest Service and started having the conversation. Okay, so I, I, I'm very, we're very blessed to have agencies like the BLM and the Forest Service around, but typically they're kind of a, a very rigid organization. What was their first reaction when you say, okay, I want you to do something you've never done before and, uh, and let these ranchers group stuff together? Well, they were pretty good, I'll be honest. They had good people there. They uh, knew there were some resource problems in the area and they were looking for ways to address them. And so we approached them with this and they said, wow, that'll be hard. And they started talking about NEPA and the time it'll take. And you know, he says, well, tell us worst case scenario, how long is it gonna take to do this? And they said, well, if everything goes just wrong, it'll take three or four years. It's now been almost eight. <laughs> so okay. uh, that, part's so that part's pretty predictable. <laughs> but, uh, but surprisingly, they were very amenable. And, uh, and the hard part, hardest part, or one of the hardest parts, is they've had to be amenable four or five times because they've had four or five managers in each agency in that period of time. And each time a new manager comes in, you almost have to start from scratch and get them to buy off and be willing to, to move forward. And that's part of the extra time that we took. Was it scary? Was it really scary for you to think about turning in your allotment to the BLM? Or is your Forest Service or BLM, or do you have a little bit of both? I here? have some of both. Uh -huh. And we didn't really turn it into them. What we did was form an LLC. And so all 36 permittees are now part of the Three Creeks Grazing LLC. You know, you have to put a lot of trust in these other 35 guys, don't you? Well, you, we've got a lot of trust in, in not only the other permittees, uh, but we've got to trust the agencies. Uh, we've got to trust the research that says it's going to be a good thing for the resource. Because in Rich County, uh, agriculture is still king in terms of, of our economy. Oh, yeah. And uh, we are very dependent on grazing on public lands. Uh, it's the only way that cow-calf production is feasible in Rich County. And so if we're looking for our kids and our grandkids to continue a, a way of life that we absolutely love, that we want to pass down from generation to generation, we got to make sure that we're doing the best we can for the resource so that BLM and Forest Service are going to allow grandkids to run cows on that. So 
when Deseret Livestock started this, they actually found that they were able to support wildlife better, have better range conditions because they were moving the cattle more frequently, mm -hmm. and it actually allowed them to increase the number of cattle they ran on their property. So they actually saw a net gain in the cow-calf uh, numbers that were, they were putting out on the range. Am I correct in that? You are correct. They almost doubled their stocking range. So I'm not sure we'll get that. <laughs> you know, that's a hope that we have. But if we can keep from losing AUMs, if we can keep from losing time, uh, it's a net benefit to us. And we know that once we get in this system that we'll be more drought proof, that those cows won't have to come home early. And in Rich County, your cows going home early is a big deal because that's that much more hay you're going to have to buy. Is this a more secure way for you as a permit holder to ranch? It puts a lot of responsibility on us to make sure this works. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Three Creeks LLC, we're going to be monitoring ourselves to a big extent. I mean, we're still going to report to Forest Service and BLM. But if we get lazy, if we don't rotate properly, if we don't get cows moved when they should be moved, you know, that, that's all going to negatively impact this. So uh, we've put a lot of trust in each other and committed that we're gonna make this work. And, and I think that's an important point that Dell makes is they're stepping up. Uh, this isn't easier, I mean, it's easier. We've got some of the allotments now of the 10 that are included in this where they turn them out May 15th and they don't go back and check really for the most part until September 15th when those cows come home. That's all gonna change. They're gonna have to be there on a daily, weekly basis making the moves and it's gonna cost up front because Cows and calves are going to get separated, they're going to have doggies, there's going to be some issues and the first several years the cows may not gain more weight. And, and we've tried to be upfront about that and I think Dell would say that we have been, that, that there's some risks associated with this and some, they're putting skin in the game. If you put all your cows together, and I don't know if they're literally going to be together in the same pasture, but if, you, if all permit holders have their herd together, can't you guys help each other move them around? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And and actually, there's going to be, as I mentioned earlier, about 3,200 head of cows. There, there's going to be basically two herds, so there'll be 16 in each herd. Right. And yeah, and, and we've always helped each other. You don't go out and just move yours. When you go to move from pasture to pasture, you move everybody's. And, and that's one of the great parts about it. I mean, uh, as independent as ranchers are, and they're probably... They're way more independent than almost any agricultural group, I think. Yeah, uh, I agree. Is there's a certain camaraderie of of taking care of each other, moving cows together, being on your horse, and and as I mentioned before, I don't want to get all sentimental about it, but having your kids with you while you do that, uh, pass on that way of life, because let's moving cows with a bunch of other ranchers is a lot more fun than irrigating with dad. You know, if, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, <laughs> if you're going to make them love this, you got to have some of the fun that, that goes with it. No, that's absolutely true. And you know, the thing is that that is such a consistent message. So you guys living in the city and you keep hearing these ranchers all over the state talk about the way of life and their family and a great way to raise their kids. The, this, these are not talking points that are coming from like some political action group. These guys really feel this. So uh, how are you going to divide up the if this goes back to the theoretical question. Sure. Your your conditions approve on the range to a point where the Forest Service, the BLM, look at it and say, yeah, much as we'd like to not say yes, you can run more cows. How are you going to divide up the growth between the, the allotment holders? Well, we're in on a percent. You know, each of us have so many permits now, and that's a percentage of the total. So if we get more, they will be distributed on a percentage of the total based on your percentage existing. So are you rebranding them as uh, as LLC? You're no. keeping your own cows within Absolutely. the Absolutely. You're just Absolutely. sharing the ground, not, right. The, not right. the stock. Yeah, all of the brands are registered by the LLC, and so they'll be branded the different brands. Otherwise, it'd be a nightmare when you came home to try to sort back everybody's cows yeah. and calves. Gee, that Lamborn guy, he ended up with all the skinny, <laughs> all the skinny cows. I'm not exactly sure what's going on here. That might create some problems. So no, it's everybody maintains ownership of their livestock. So there are other guys out here, there are other groups of ranchers that are looking at this right now to go, hmm, what's the one thing you want to tell them? I think uh, from my perspective, it's based on trust. Uh, we trusted Troy and his group as they came in and, and uh, initiated the idea. Uh, we've put a lot of trust in each other. We've trusted the, the uh, 
agencies. But, you know, Covey, a number of years ago, wrote a book called The Speed of Trust. And it, trust makes things happen faster and it makes things happen better. And so I think that, that base level of trust between the permittees, the agencies, GIP, all the people involved is critical to this even getting off the ground. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think traditionally we've not trusted each other enough. And if we're going to move forward, benefit the resource, we got to uh, trust each other selectively. What was Reagan's old saying? Trust, trust and verify. And verify. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's where we're at. You know, I would just say that this is an opportunity for, for ranchers. Uh, it's been a war of attrition in the West. You know, in 1934, the Taylor Grazing Act was passed, and, and at that time, we had a set level of grazing. In, since 1960 in Utah, we've lost about two-thirds of the grazing capacity that we had on public lands. And we've, we've got to stop that war, that attrition in this industry if we're going to keep these rural communities in these small counties in Utah viable. And this is a way forward. This is a way that can be ecologically and economically sustainable to where we don't have to see a continued reduction in numbers. We can go out, we can be good stewards, which takes more effort on the part of the permittees, but we get better results. We get that clean water. We get the wildlife that everybody wants in abundance. We get those values that everybody wants from their public lands and, and should get, and we still maintain the economic viability of our ranchers. We can make profit by removing that fuel. That's a good thing, it's gotta be a good thing. If we can't, you know, we can't always incur costs to make things better. If we can make money and make things better at the same time, which is what this will do, that's a win-win for everybody, is it not? It really, it really is. Well, congratulations to you. Thank, for, thank you for joining us. We'll be right back with the county seat. We'll continue our conversation about time grazing, and we will look at the people that started it up in Rich County and see exactly how well it's benefited them as we take a tour of desert land and livestock when we come back. Antelope Island State Park. Think of it as a treasure island because of the unique activities and treasured experiences you'll enjoy there. The 25th annual Antelope by Moonlight Bike Ride is coming to Antelope Island State Park Friday, July 27th at White Rock Bay. Tailgate party begins at 7.30 p.m. Bike ride begins at 10 p.m. under a full moon. Register now by going to antelopebymoonlight.com. Discover nature, buffalo, historic gar ranch, and more at Antelope Island State Park. Visit plaindavis.com slash antelope today. There's a little place on a Utah map where I was raised, where my heart's at, where the sagebrush grows wild and high, and the stars come out at night. Oh, there ain't nothing like being raised in the basin with a youth reservation, skin starvation, that Duchesne County life. Too often we find ourselves in shoes like these, or these. Wouldn't it be nice to change into something more like this, or this? How about these? Put on whatever shoes you prefer and come to Beaver County. We have exactly the adventure you need to put under them. So the next time you want to change out of these, come to Beaver County where you can jump into a pair of these. Beaver County, Utah, lace up for adventure. Look south to adventure. Look south to beauty. Look south to San Juan County. Out here, the road goes on forever, and what you'll find will change how you see the world. Climb on your OHV and discover forgotten landscapes and vistas that challenge the imagination. From Blanding and Monticello to the cliff faces of Monument Valley, we're open and ready for you to explore. San Juan County, Utah's Canyon Country. Welcome back to the county seat. Now, while the concept of combining grazing allotments on public land is new, as we discussed a few minutes ago, the concept of time grazing is not. So let's look at the pioneers on time grazing with a tour of Deseret land and livestock on the ground. You know, I believe that most, most arid lands evolved with groups of herbivores periodically feeding heavily on the landscape and then moving on. Whether you're talking about bison, whether you're talking about pronghorns, whether you're talking about uh, grasshoppers and locusts. Periodically there were big populations that would eat a bunch of forage and then move on. 
I think the land is used to that. So what we try to do with our, with our livestock, even though they're, they're not necessarily native to this area, is make their function on the landscape be like that. In other words, they come through, they graze a pasture, they take the vegetation off, but they don't graze it to the point or for a long enough period of time where they really hurt plants. And then they move and what we do is we allow that pasture to rest and recover, grow back before we come in and we graze it again. From what our monitoring, what we've seen is that the, the land responds, the plants respond. Essentially what we're seeing is less bare ground and more live living plants on the landscape and a good diversity of plants, grasses, flowering plants, and shrubs. And that, in my opinion, is the key to why we, we have healthy wildlife populations as well as you know, productive livestock herds. With time control grazing, what you're doing is you are limiting where the cattle are and for how long they're going to be there and how many you have in any one spot. Okay. You're going to move them in a very controlled fashion from one portion of the range to another portion of the range in such a way that you're able to manage the resources of the range and water quality such that we, we end up with greater productivity on that land. From a range health perspective, I think we've seen range improvements, um, dramatic range improvements, a lot more forage production, better functioning riparian areas, cleaner runoff, more water gets in the ground and is utilized for plant growth as, than, than what runs off the ranch. From an enterprise perspective, we've been able to run significantly more cattle than what was run um, prior to our change in management. And we've also seen increases in the wildlife populations as well. That's the whole goal here, is to make sure that uh, if the allotments stay and they're managed a little bit differently, to not just get the benefit of the output, the benefit of the market production of cattle, but also to accrue the non-market benefits. That is, we're providing better habitat for animals, which has a value, and we're providing better water quality, which also has a value. We've just grazed this pasture. We've grazed it for a number of days, and and this is the dry, one of the driest years I've ever seen here. We've taken a lot of the riparian vegetation off as well as the upland vegetation, but we haven't killed plants. It's gonna recover. You can go out there and you won't see a lot of height on, on some of the plants, but you'll see enough that they can photosynthesize, they can you know, get themselves healthy again and, and grow back. Essentially, we're going to get a win-win. We're going to be able to keep livestock production in a rural portion of the state, and we get to improve water quality. So now you've got water quality, wildlife resources saying, hey, this is going to work. For all the answers we've been given today, there are still a couple of nagging questions. I'll cover those by putting in my two cents worth when we come back. There are meetings, and then there are gatherings. At the Davis Conference Center, we know the difference. Turn your event into something more than just another business summit. With over 70,000 square feet of flexible meeting space, state-of-the-art presentation amenities, and inspiring architecture, the Davis Conference Center is designed to deliver stellar results in a majestic setting. Take your convention to the next level. Schedule now at davisconferencecenter.com. If you're looking for gold at the end of the rainbow, you'll probably be disappointed because in Paiute County, the only thing you'll find at the end of a rainy day is the promise of adventure. Highway 89 is your access point through Marysville and the historic trails of Bullion Canyon. Find yourself in the mountains one minute and the desert the next as you follow in the footsteps of the pioneers. Whitewater raft, fish, hike, all within a few minutes of a comfortable bed and a warm meal. Find out why the world has made Paiute County its off-road destination. Paiute County, the place where the rainbow ends. In a place that is beyond words, there is nothing to be said, except take your time in Bryce Canyon country. For seven years, Utah's Community Voice has been the county seat, a program that looks beyond politics to spotlight the issues and stories that really matter to you and your community. 
Now you can help set Utah's agenda for the future by joining the conversation. Become a county seat sponsor and help support those conversations that are critical to the future of state government. Contact us at 801-947-8888 to make your contribution to help the voice of Utah be heard like never before. Welcome back to the county seat. It has been quite a discovery to see today how good empirical science applied to the ground can magnify what happens with it. I mean, I guess we shouldn't be surprised, as several studies have pointed out that within my lifetime, vegetable and crop production has increased annual yields by 10 times. That's just in the last 50 years. It is also no surprise that this system works to improve grazing on a much smaller scale, as we pointed out in a story we did last year. What is a surprise are the number of people who think that this kind of range management is a bad thing. That instead of improving habitat overall by manipulating the land, we should do nothing to the land other than remove cattle. Yet it has been proven multiple times and in multiple places that treating the land and bringing it to prime condition improves the soil, fire suppression, habitat for wildlife, it improves view shed of the landscape, biodiversity of the flora, and most important, it improves watershed and water availability for all of the above. So if these things have been proven to be true empirically, why did the Western Watershed Project and the Sierra Club, both known environmental mass litigators, protest the Three Creeks Project, held it up for a couple of years? Was it to seek financial reward from the federal government by prevailing in a legal dispute and claiming the legal fees? To use the battle to generate support and donations of their base? Or was it part of their religion that Mother Earth contains the only wisdom on how to manage land and we should excuse ourselves from the range, return to the city, and wait to die off? Now, I know many of you think that that sounds like a rant at best or a reach at the very least. But if one of the biggest lessons learned by desert land and livestock was the improvement of the watershed, why would the Western Watershed Project oppose it? If the wildlife habitat and populations improved markedly, why would the Sierra Club oppose it? Aren't both those goals defined in their respective mission statements? I pose these questions as rhetorical. I don't want to create a firestorm of name-calling as happened with the wild horse treaties that we did last month. But I do want to have those of you who are wading into this issue for the first time to stop and think about what's going on and share with me your thoughts as to why good things on the ground seem to have so much opposition. That's my two cents worth today. As always, we look forward to your contribution and the discussion to follow on social media. Here are the links and we invite you to like and follow our pages for more news and discussion that happens during the week. Next week, we will be answering the question, who is more important in the big scheme of things, the farmer or the fish? Is flushing the Colorado River for the fish the best way to protect them? That's it, and we'll see you next week on the county seat.